I am a member of uh, the Virtual Physiological Human uh, Institute and chair of the student committee of this, uh, of this institute. And I'm the chair of the VPH Summer School. I'm also a researcher uh, at UPF, Department of uh, Technologies of Information and Communication, and the research unit, the same method, which is, which is biomedical engineering research yeah. unit. So, um, let me switch up the phone. Um, so, I would like to introduce you briefly uh, the VPH Summer School, uh, its pillars, how it integrates with the VPH uh, Institute, and, and give you a few of uh, the different um, the different aspects of the of the agenda. So, uh, the VPH Summer School was born in 2016. Six ends, uh, this is an event that uh, we have been organizing every year, except last year because of, of COVID. Um, and uh, it's co-organized by the Virtual Physiological Human uh, Students Committee and by the BSN Medtech Research Unit, so uh, here at UPF. And it aims to provide junior engineers, early researchers, and medical doctors with an integrative and practical view of state-of-the-art research for in silico medicine, from basic science and clinical needs to uh, model applications. So that's, that's important. It, it really tackles uh, three groups of uh, early professionals, so engineers, researchers, and, and medical doctors. So we aim to make all those things accessible to everyone, even if sometimes it might sound very technical. Uh, we have 14 international keynote speakers, and according to the, um, according to the objective of the Summa School, you will see that the talks uh, have a day-to-day -day evolution. So uh, today's Thursday, we will have talks about basic science and clinical understanding. Then uh, we will move to acquisition, processing, and quantification. So specifically, we're talking about uh, data and how data are integrated into models. Uh, then we start to enter into modeling technologies um, by, by uh, seeing examples of uh, organ, cell, molecular skills, uh, skills models. Then it will go a little bit more into detail, so into the numerical uh, implementation, into the validation, uh, into the technical coping of, uh, of models. And the last day is a day uh, dedicated to application, where in general we have uh, industry, industrials uh, talking, and it's, it's focused on understanding decision support, therapy support. And of course, it comes along with uh, other questions uh, such as uh, such as regu regulation opportunities um, and, and model robustness uh, to have proper technology transfer. Uh, we have one uh, virtual physiological human uh, honorary lecture, which will be given on on Wednesday by Alphonse Oxpa. Uh, we have awards presentations. In the afternoons, we have uh, 15 hours of guided hands-on. So uh, you've chosen the hands-on, and then uh, during 15 hours, you will be working on these hands-ons, which aims to be uh, a research story. And at the end of, of, the, of the week, you will be present this research uh, story. There, is, uh, there are four poster sessions with one poster competition, and there are uh, two workshops. Um, so we have a track record since 2016. We have a track record of collaboration with innovative training networks. Um, that's part of the Marius Code of Statutory uh, Actions from the European Commission. Uh, so first, uh, the VPH School was uh, supported uh, by an innovative training network, uh, European Industrial Doctorate Study Function. Uh, then uh, it was supported by uh, the peak uh, European training networks. And uh, this year, um, for the three next years, uh, it will be supported by uh, this for all another European uh, training network. So actually then the objective is uh, to promote uh, in, silico, in silico technologies uh, for all the persons who will be uh, who will be then uh, the professionals making real uh, this, this technology within, uh, within, the, within the near future, we hope. So accordingly, we need to have specific training in uh, science and technology, specific training uh, in medicine, and this is why uh, medical doctors are actually very important, uh, very important uh, 
players and participants in this DPH summer school. If anything, uh, biomedical engineering, uh, we tend to organize more things for, uh, for engineers and uh, for technology oriented or biology science. Um, and uh, since we're talking about um, since we're talking about a technology that needs to be uh, applied uh, to uh, tackle um, societal challenges, so uh, transversal training in healthcare, transfer of technology, health technology assessment, standards and regulation, societal challenges, public fund strategies, responsible research and innovation are so are so important. Uh, I will um, I will play a video. I hope you will be able to to hear the the sound uh, that reflects what would be uh, the the ultimate goal uh, of the virtual physiological human of uh, in silico uh, medicine. The Virtual Physiological Human Institute presents Digital Twin. Can you hear correctly the song? Fantastic. Journey Better Healthcare. What if you could have an identical twin? Someone who breathes, moves, and reacts like you. Someone who can help you get better when you're ill. Your life would be safer and healthier, right? Engineers, biologists, and doctors are working together to create a digital twin that can be used to test your medical treatments, simulating how your body will react to them. This is possible only by understanding the way organs work and are connected in the body and how diseases progress. The most advanced scientific knowledge will then be translated into a digital copy of you. This is in silico medicine, a personalized and precise approach that uses computers to improve understanding, prevention, diagnosis and treatment of diseases to find the best options for every one of us. With the help of your digital twin, your doctor can gather precise insights into your specific medical condition and obtain increased confidence regarding the best treatment to use. The digital twin complements the current available tests, making the healthcare system faster, cheaper and less risky. It also reduces the unnecessary use of drugs. It makes your costly hospital stays shorter and expedites your recovery. This greater efficiency translates into the opportunity for doctors of having more time available to spend with you and build and maintain a relationship of trust. That's why the digital twin represents a true ally to guarantee a better, less expensive and tailored healthcare for you and the entire population. Okay, so uh, through this video, so you see actually there's a vision of what would be the digital twin. Digital twin concept is not new. Uh, actually, it has emerged with uh, the aerospatial uh, industry um, decades ago. And its application to the living and to medicine is, is highly challenging. And uh, so this is a vision and uh, there are plenty of researchers and, and no companies, so trying to make this vision uh, real. So there are technical challenges by coupling everything and, and finding the proper uh, model representations for different aspects of the living. And, um, and then of course, uh, there, there are all, all the problems that uh, how to make it really, really safe and to achieve uh, the real impact that we want uh, for, for, the, for the society. And this is why this transversal training I was mentioning is, is very important and timely. The virtual. Oh, sorry. So, uh, specific training during the VPH summer school is actually targeted by the morning team lectures and the afternoon, the afternoon hands ons. And for the transversal training, so we don't have time in, in one week uh, to have a very deep transversal training but we already have uh, specific workshops that target this transversal training. So on, on Thursday, we have a workshop about HPC and silico medicine, which tackles uh, large infrastructures in collaboration with Combiomet. Then on Friday, uh, we, we will have two workshops, uh, one workshop about strategies and funding schemes in health and well-being, which will be given by the National Contact Point uh, for Innovation. And in the afternoon, we have a round table with different uh, stakeholders, industrials, uh, researchers, um, healthcare center representative and patient representative. 
So around the thematic issue, accommodating a new medical technology for society. So uh, where is the meeting point between awareness, expectations, and uh, effective capacity? Uh, of course, uh, the student school and then the, the activity of the student uh, DPHI student committee uh, aims to promote early stage research careers. And uh, as part of it, so we have uh, different awards. So today we'll have then the presentation of an award that has already been given, which is the best uh, VPHI thesis award in, in silico medicine. So you will see an example of a PhD thesis that has been selected by external reviewers uh, for the excellence uh, of capacity or knowledge gap methodological approaches, approach research outputs and international uh, integration. So I, I think it's, it's a very good experience to see so what would be one representation of an, an excellent uh, PhD research in uh, in silico technologies for for health in medicine. Uh, on Friday we'll be ha we will have the best PPHI uh, poster awards uh, based on the evaluation of the poster that will be uh, presented during the, the summer school, and later we'll have also the best hands-on uh, awards. Uh, after the presentation of the of the different hands-ons, so uh, the awards might provide you a bit of money or uh, present or whatever. But I think that the most important thing that an award uh, brings you uh, is uh, an official international recognition and an entry in your CV. So especially when uh, you're finishing your PhD, you enter the wild world of uh, research and then trying to develop an academic career, if it is what you want to do, of course. And uh, any entry in the, in the CV in the first years is, is very important because this is a world that is uh, very competitive, uh, I, must, I must admit. So don't ignore the awards, present yourself. If you don't have an award, don't worry, uh, present again and again and again. If you don't have any awards in your CV, that's not a problem. You might have grants, and, and these are also very valuable uh, input. You have journal papers, etc. Uh, but if you have awards, of course, then this is this is a little plus that you will always have. Uh, for practicalities, uh, so you have received an email by by Aneta. And then I will ask Aneta to. Uh, to manifest herself so that you can, everyone can, can, can see her. Uh, Aneta is uh, a very important organizing pillar of this EPH summer school. She has been uh, sending you various email and I, I hope you have read these emails. <laughs> and um, so we have, uh, we have a color code in the program. Uh, we have the green sessions that are for talks, posters, workshops, and awards. They all use uh, the main link for the VPH summer school, which is a present uh, Zoom link. So under this link for the poster sessions, and you will have, you will see different, you will see different rooms, and you will be able then to uh, to roam freely uh, around among the rooms. Uh, there are the yellow sessions that are the hands-on. So you have received a specific uh, link for each specific hands-on. And then we have the roundtable in silico medicine on Friday, which is a pink session. And this is a nozzle link. This is an open Zoom link for the hands-on. So please don't, re don't redistribute any link associated with the green sessions or the yellow sessions, uh, because it's reserved for registered people. But for the roundtable in silico, roundtable in silico medicine on Friday, uh, feel free to redistribute this link because this is this is a session open to open to everyone. Uh, it will be in English and it will be uh, simultaneously translated in in Spanish. So we couldn't do uh, we couldn't do more translation for those countries. Sorry about that. Um, so for the for the poster sessions, um, I guess after these uh, months months and more than one year of, of uh, pandemics. Uh, most of you are well familiar with uh, Zoom and, and whatever uh, video conference platform. Uh, but just as remember, so you're under the main link of the DPH Summer School, which is this one. 
So uh, you will click on the breakout rooms uh, icon. So this is the Apple layout. Uh, I don't know if the Windows layout is exactly equal. Uh, then um, the breakout rooms windows will pop up and then you will be able then to join uh, the poster room uh, where you want to, uh, um, that you want to, to, where you want to interact with, interact with the speaker. Okay, so each uh, room is identified by the name of the speaker and uh, we will have by this afternoon, this is the title of, uh, of the talks. Okay, so that's it. Uh, if you want to have more information about the VPH Institute, uh, I dropped here a couple of videos that I will not play in Silicon Medicine will be the future and the video of the VPHI uh, day webinar that was held in, in January. Uh, I invite you in your free time then to have a look at these videos. I think it, it gives a very nice uh, overview of how integrative are the activities. So uh, that's it from my side. No, I would like to maybe uh, first of all, uh, Aneta, if you can manifest yourself so that everyone uh, sees you and, and if you have a message. Hello. Do you hear me? No. Yes. Yes, at the moment I don't have a message. Uh, we can continue with the speaker, I guess. Perfect. So now I'm leaving the floor to uh, Miguel Angel, who will be then chairing uh, the first talk of this VPH uh, senior school. So I hope everyone will enjoy. Okay, thanks very much, Jerome. Uh, I, I would like to um, also welcome everyone to, to this event. I think that this is really a, a very important event for, for us here in, in UPF. And, and in general, thank the, the support of uh, the BPH Institute and, and the different uh, sponsors. Uh, I have the, the pleasure and the, and the great honor to, to introduce the first speaker of the, of the summer school, um, who is Laura Sochek. Um, she's uh, here in Barcelona uh, at the Valdebron Institute of Oncology. Um, and her background is on molecular biology and genetics. Uh, she, uh, well, starting in, in Italy uh, at the La Sapienza, where she did her PhD, uh, then moved to the States, to San Francisco for, for a number of years, I think around 10 or so. Uh, and then, well, she moved to, to Barcelona, where she's currently an ICREA professor and, and is leading a, a, a very important effort on, on treatments with uh, mini proteins that she will tell us about. Um, I have to say, it's a, it's a bit of a, of a challenge to, um, to place Laura in the program because the program goes from uh, basic science to um, translation and uh, validation, clinical um, um, validation and then exploitation, etc. And she's one of these persons that doesn't quite feel comfortable with these labels. So she's uh, really working on basic science and exploitation and validation and clinical uh, impact. And, and I, think, uh, I think this is really, uh, really something to, to to, to consider when we see her talk, uh, where I'm sure she will talk also about her efforts with the, with the company Peptonic that she founded. Um, so without further ado, I, I would like to, to give the floor to Laura and, and welcome her to the stage. And thank you for, for being here. Thank you, Miguel Angel. Uh, very nice introduction. Um, and I, I'm very grateful for being able to kick off the talks in this uh, great event. Thank you very much for inviting me. I hope to give you some idea and some tips uh, on uh, things that can uh, be done in uh, basic research uh, that then can eventually impact uh, the clinical practice. So what I'm telling you today is more of a story actually. So let me start sharing my screen. Um, First of all, I would like to start with uh, this concept. Everybody that works in cancer dreams of the ideal cancer drug. Uh, we all have different concepts about uh, how this drug should look like, but we have reached uh, a certain consensus. Uh, we all think that uh, this drug should target a non-redundant function, uh, absolutely necessary for tumor cells, but not for normal cells. 
And uh, the most common approach so far has been cataloging all the mutations that we can find in cancer uh, on the basis of the fact that we think that these mutations might be the drivers of, uh, of cancer. However, we have encountered quite a lot of challenges there because as you know, cancer is um, characterized by genomic instability. That means that uh, during its evolution, there is a continuous mutational noise that actually can mask the real driver of uh, cancer. Not only evolution uh, passes through what we call evolutionary bottlenecks. So there are some crises uh, during the uh, development of cancer that require at a certain point, a certain mutation that might be absolutely dispensable after that point in evolution. So if we focus on that mutation, we probably we will not get any, uh, any result there. Uh, however, this approach has given uh, quite a lot of uh, success stories. Uh, uh, we have learned how to tailor different therapies uh, around different mutations. Uh, you're very familiar with the concept of personalized medicine. And that has given uh, definitely results. However, this approach has also uh, shown us uh, some source of frustration. Um, I don't know if you have ever played this uh, game, but it really feels like that. We hit a function in cancer and cancer reorganizes to start using an alternative one. Um, so that has, of course, uh, given, given us the idea that uh, maybe we can increase the number of hammers that we use in this game. So uh, and to use a lot of therapies that we combine, hoping that the cancer will not be able to organize. As you know, though, this approach also comes uh, with a lot of toxicity. When we increase drugs in the cocktail that we give to patients, we also increase the toxicity. So uh, an alternative uh, uh, possibility is to try to find something that is not as redundant as these targets. Um, I made the comparison here with the battery, something that is really crucial inside cancer cells uh, and something that uh, cancer cells cannot live without. And what I'm presenting you here today is the fact that we think that we have found such a function in cancer. Um, so our focus is this protein called MIC. MIC is the um, most infamous uh, oncogene in cancer. Its overexpression or the regulation is associated with the majority, if not all, human cancers. MIC is actually a transcription factor, a transcription factor that has a pleiotropic uh, effect in cells. Uh, MIC controls different aspects of uh, cell biology, such as proliferation, cell growth, differentiation, metabolism. And in some situations, it can even trigger apoptosis. It's so pleiotropic that has been uh, uh, compared to a music director. Um, inside the cell, MIC can uh, uh, direct the transcription of up to 25% of the genes uh, within the cell. But uh, this uh, regulation is actually really, really fine-tuned because in physiological conditions, MIC gets turned on really, really briefly. It's half-life, it's only 20 minutes. So when a cell needs to divide, MIC gets turned on, directs the music, and then it gets shut down. It disappears very, very quickly from the cell. What happens in cancer is that this switch is completely lost, so that MIC keeps directing the music, keeps instructing the cells to proliferate indefinitely. And this also leads to invasion of the surrounding tissues. One uh, feature that makes uh, MIC quite unique among other oncogenes uh, is that uh, it's not frequently mutated. You remember at the beginning, I told you that we are used to catalog mutations in cancer, thinking that those are the most important ones uh, in driving or maintaining cancer. Well, MIC doesn't appear mutated often in cancer. There are cases in which uh, it's amplified. So these are examples of uh, different types of uh, tumors in which you can find amplification of MIC. But the most frequent scenario is a different one. 
is a scenario in which basically other mutations that we find in cancer, let's say PI3 kinase mutations, uh, EGFR mutation, RAS mutations, they all funnel through me inside the, the nuclei of the cells. What does that mean? That basically all these mutations uh, signal through MIC, and MIC is their culprit, their minion, the effector that basically controls all the transcriptional programs, intracellular and extracellular programs that allow cancer cells to thrive. Uh, MIC is responsible from basic proliferation of cancer cells to the construction and the development of a, a tumor microenvironment. For example, MIC is responsible for neoandrogenesis that allows cancer cells to capture all their nutrients uh, and uh, grow. But another aspect, very important aspect of MIC tumorigenesis has to do with the immune system. In the last years, it's been shown that uh, uh, cancer cells that express MIC can also produce molecules that make cancer cells invisible to the immune system. Um, cancer cells uh, that have MIC, for example, produce PDL1 or CD47. These signals that are called don't eat me, don't see me signals so that basically make uh, cancer cells invisible to the immune system. So because of all these reasons, you can imagine that inhibiting MIC in cancer would be really a good strategy. Nevertheless, uh, after more than 40 years of literature on MIC, there is still no MIC inhibitor in the clinic. And the reason is that MIC for a very long time has been considered an undruggable target. Why? Some reasons are technical. Uh, for example, MIC is an intrinsically disordered protein. What does that mean? That it's a protein that changes shape all the time in solution. You can imagine this blob changing shape all the time. So because of that, uh, designing an inhibitor, a small molecule inhibitor, that recognizes it uh, with uh, sufficient uh, specificity is quite difficult. So this is the technical challenge. Another technical challenge uh, is related to its location. It's inside the nuclei and uh, not all drugs uh, can penetrate in that. Another uh, complication is that it doesn't have an active site uh, like an enzymatic pocket. That would really help. Nick doesn't have one. Uh, the other reason is that uh, MIC is actually a, a protein family. It comprises C-MIC and MIC and L-MIC. They are very similar and they can replace each other in some situations. So if we want to inhibit MIC, we better inhibit them all. And last but not least, uh, when I started working on this, I was told leave MIC alone because uh, MIC is needed for normal tissue maintenance. So if you inhibit MIC, you're going to cause a lot of catastrophic side effects in normal tissues. The interesting thing is that I couldn't find any evidence of that in the literature. So I decided to, to try. Uh, and as a student, I focus on uh, this aspect of MIC biology. I told you that MIC is an intrinsically disordered protein. However, at some point, in order to function, it needs to dimerize with this partner called MAX. Uh, and when it forms dimers with MAX, uh, MIC assumes, the C terminus of MIC assumes this uh, very nice structure on the right side of the slide. It's the basic helix loop helix using superstructure. Um, it basically forms a forcep that can recognize DNA. This is how MIC MAX work as transcription factors. And um, as a student, I thought, if I want to inhibit MIC, maybe I can either disrupt the interaction with MAX or disrupt their interaction with the DNA. And I was very lucky because I managed to do both things at once. I basically designed, uh, designed a fake MAX, an alternative partner for uh, MIC, which I called OMOMIC. It's, uh, simply a portion of the MIC protein, the PHLA zip domain, exactly, um, with four mutations in the leucine zipper. Because of these mutations, while MIC can form only dimers with MAX, OMOMIC can do much more. OMOMIC can sequester MIC, wild type MIC, away from DNA, because OMOMIC MIC cannot bind DNA anymore. Omomic can also form homodimers and heterodimers with MAX that instead bind DNA 
but they are silent timers. They do not activate transcription. So basically they shut down the transcription of the target genes that are normally activated by Nikimax. So we have two mechanisms of actions here. We have the active sequestration of the target, Nick, away from DNA, and competition for binding to its target genes. Amomic was designed quite a long time ago, as you can see, and it was validated as a pan mic inhibitor. So it can inhibit c and MIC and l -mic. It can inhibit them all at once. I showed uh, from the very beginning that the cancer cells were sensitive to Amomic, while normal cells simply slow down. Um, and I was very excited about that, but I was told that uh, in order to show the efficacy of uh, an inhibitor, um, a potential drug, I had to do the experiment in animals, not just in cells. That was a really uh, dramatic moment for me because I didn't want to work with animals. I was an animalist. Uh, I, you know, I, I signed all the petitions, uh, uh, the PETA forms, etc. But then I realized that I had to, if, if I really believed in what I was doing, I had to show that this was valid also in animals. And, and I had to trust my results. I had seen the cancer cells die, the normal cells were completely fine. So I packed my bags and I went from Rome to San Francisco to UCSF to the laboratory of Gerald Evan uh, over there. And I started working uh, with mice. Uh, and I made my first mouse in which I was able to express omomic systemically. What does that mean? This mouse had an extra gene, a transgene for omomic, that was switchable. Uh, this uh, uh, omomic was basically inducible, adding doxycycline to the drinking water of the animals. So the animals had no omomic until I added doxycycline to their water. At that point, the animals started expressing omomic virtually in every tissue of the body. So this was the closest I could get to modeling a drug, a systemic drug uh, against me. And I crossed this animal with uh, a very well characterized model of lung tumor genesis. Uh, this is the lock stop lock keras g 12 d model um, characterized in Tyler Jack's lab. And um, so this model is a not in model in which the the endogenous Keras has been replaced by a constitutively active Keras G12D, preceded by a stop cassette. This stop cassette can be removed by Cree recombinase. So if we give adenocree intranasally to the animals, the animals have activation of Keras specifically in the respiratory tissue. That means that they develop hyperplasia in the adenomas by four, six weeks and carcinomas by 16, 26 weeks in their lung. So these animals, as I was saying, develop uh, lesions, tumor lesions all over their lung, even hundreds of lesions. But we had the possibility of turning on omomic in these animals, uh, giving some doxycycline. We started with a very brief treatment, only three days. And I was basically appalled when I saw that these three days of treatment already caused shrinkage of the tumors. This was really, really surprising to me. I expected the tumors uh, to become, to stop growing, not to become smaller. And in uh, less than one week, uh, all the tumors were gone. Uh, this was really, really mind blowing. And we published it in Nature in 2008, showing that inhibitimic really had a huge therapeutic impact. Not only this uh, um, treatment showed us that if we treated uh, the animals for only once with, uh, with uh, omomic, uh, this is the blue line, we already had a survival advantage in the animals. But if we treated them repeatedly, metronomically, with omomic several times, we could keep them tumor-free indefinitely. These mice uh, were treated for more than one year uh, with, with omomic, and they never, never developed tumors again. Not only we were able also to show that the catastrophic side effects that people expected in normal tissue never happened. The, the animals were completely fine. They had very, very mild uh, side effects in normal proliferating tissues that simply slowed down. So if you shave the animals, for example, the hair would regrow more slowly. If male um, mice uh, fought 
in their cage with their litter mates, their bunt would slow uh, would uh, would close more slowly, but it would close. So nothing major happened in these animals. So the the incredible therapeutic effect, therapeutic impact that we were seeing against tumor was accompanied by an unexpected and excellent therapeutic window. This really changed the paradigm around the world and some other people started working on their own MIP inhibitors because of this first publication. However, I was criticized again that maybe what I was doing was too simple, that mouse tumors uh, didn't have enough mutations. This was a mouse model in which there was one mutation in KRAS. So I was told that, that uh, this was not sufficient to predict anything that would happen in human tumors. By that time, I had decided to come back to Europe and I chose the Valdebron Institute of Oncology, uh, where I had the chance also to work with uh, tumor samples. Uh, but in the meantime, I had started repeating the experiments uh, in the absence of P53. As you know, P53 is the guardian of the genome. So in the absence of P53, these tumors actually accumulate additional mutations besides KRAS, and they become extremely aggressive. They grow much more quickly, and they invade the, the lung of these animals uh, in a very, very impressive uh, way, as you can see here. Despite that, despite the presence of multiple mutations in all these tumors, Amomic was still effective. The only thing that changed was the kinetics. Um, without P53, these tumors have a higher threshold in order to uh, undergo apoptosis. So instead of one week in order to clear the lung, it took four weeks. But as you can see, there is a huge remodeling of the tissue and disappearance of the tumors again. Indeed, the metronomic treatment with Amomic also in this case uh, um, basically eradicated the tumors. So at that point, we concluded that at least in this type of, type of tumors, MIC is a unique and non-redundant uh, function around which tumors cannot evolve. Um, but again, um, I, was, uh, I was told that I had to move uh, a little bit forward uh, with more complicated com um, models. At that point, I was at the Val de Bron and I, I got interested uh, in this particular type of tumor, which is the glioblastoma, where, which is the most common intrinsic brain tumor and extremely lethal. Um, glioblastoma has been related uh, to MIC expression. MIC expression is correlated with glioma grade. Uh, and so it's highest uh, in the glioblastoma, which is the highest grade of the of this type of tumors. And uh, uh, I was, at that time I was working with a transgenic model in which uh, basically uh, the, the animal set an extra gene for mutated Harvey Rust uh, led by uh, the GFAP promoter. So Harvey Rust was expressed in the astrocytic lineage uh, in the brain of these animals. And we crossed these animals uh, with uh, uh, our inducible omomic. This work was led by Daniela Nibali and Jonathan Whitfield. Uh, as I said, I would tell you a story today. So this is a, uh, something that we published in 2014. And uh, in this model, the proliferation of the astrocytes uh, due to Harvey Russ basically fills the brain with uh, this transport form astrocytes that create a lot of intracranial pressure and are very, very, very highly invasive. But you can see some, some very dense regions with astrocytes uh, in brown here in, uh, in these uh, uh, samples. So we saw something extraordinary. This intracranial pressure basically makes first the mice be aggressive. When we have headache, uh, we are not particularly nice to our uh, you know, friends and family. And this is what happens to these animals too. They basically become aggressive and then at some point they go into a corner of the, the cage and don't want to move anymore. This is our ethical endpoint unless we have um, uh, a treatment. So we started giving these animals toxicycline. Remember, toxicycline is in, is in the drinking water and this animal doesn't want to drink. So we had to squirt water in the mouth of the animal. In a couple of days, the animals started drinking, eating, and reacting to stimuli uh, like a normal mouse would do. 
this effect was extraordinary and it was due to the fact that the intracranial pressure was completely released by the treatment with omomic. There were still after a week some residual regions of uh, high density of astrocytes, but these uh, regions were full of apoptotic cells. So omomic was uh, basically getting rid of the RAS transform astrocytes. We also noticed something really interesting uh, in these uh, uh, animals, in these uh, dense regions, there were a lot of aberrant nuclei. You can see these polynucleated astrocytes. And we thought that it was very interesting, but we didn't have an explanation at this point. However, and somebody else, uh, Emilia Favuzzi in Sergio Nassi's lab in Italy, was working with uh, Amomic in uh, glioblastoma cell lines. And she reported to us uh, that uh, um, in the presence of omic, she was seeing serious mitotic defects in these cell lines. Uh, this is uh, um, glioblastoma U87 MG cells uh, that uh, in the presence of a GFT control have absolutely normal mitosis, but in the presence of omic, we saw defects in essentially all the phases of mitosis. And Tony Joseph in the lab uh, was following these uh, uh, cells that had uh, uh, omomic RFP, RFP, that's why they are red. Uh, these polynuclear cells have uh, multiple red nuclei because of the presence of omomic. And we saw that while the rest of the population uh, was dividing in, in culture, these polynucleated cells could not divide. They were struggling, they were trying, but they could not divide and eventually died of uh, apoptosis. So um, this uh, was uh, particularly interesting to us and we wanted to see whether this was uh, true also with human samples and at the Valdebron and with a collaboration of, with Joanne Seoane at Valdebron. Um, I was able to to use for the first time patient-derived samples from the um, operating room. These uh, samples uh, can be grown in culture as neurospheres, tumor spheres, that can be implanted uh, into xenograft models uh, in mice, orthotopically in the brain of, uh, of the animals. And again, these neurospheres and tumor spheres had a switchable Omomic with doxycycline, so we could uh, follow the fate of the animals that had no omomic compared to the fate of the animals that instead had our switchable omomic. And this is the survival of these animals. You can see that uh, omomic basically saves them uh, from uh, the development uh, of uh, glioblastoma. The only mouse that we lost in this experiment uh, was. Um, had some trouble during the IVC imaging, some respiratory issues. So it had, um, during uh, autopsy, didn't show absolutely any brain tumor uh, when we, we looked at it. This was published in 2014 and basically showed that uh, uh, omomic could be effective uh, in other tumors beyond uh, um, no small cell lung cancer. And in particular, we, we suggested that could be used against glioblastoma. And we revealed a new role for making proficient mitosis uh, uh, because these uh, cells in the presence of omic died of mitotic crisis. Since then, uh, we have used omic in so many other mouse models of cancers uh, and in all of them, independently on their location, independently on the mutation that was causing the tumors, we saw uh, effectiveness of omic. Omic eradicated tumors in all these models. Some of these are already published, some are in preparation or submitted. Um, the, the big question though was, uh, how can we make this meaningful for patients? How can an omomic transition uh, be translated into a drug? Besides, <laughs> Again, there were people out there, experts in the field, that were saying that omomic could never be a drug. Um, there, were, there are reviews out there that uh, state things like uh, um, omomic is a molecule too big and bulky to be directly delivered to cells. Omomic is a 91 amino acid protein. There uh, was also who said that omomic is essentially just a proof of concept and can only work as gene therapy. Once again, uh, before these statements, maybe it was, uh, you know, the experiment was needed. Um, and uh, I had the luck of uh, uh, visiting the University of Sherbrooke 
I was invited to give a talk over there, and there was a group led by Pierre Lavigne that in 2012 published a paper in which they were using the Max BHLH zip domain that they call MaxStar, and that shown that this domain could penetrate cells spontaneously and exert some anti-mic activity. So it was obvious to me that MaxStar and Domomic were very similar, both in terms of structure and in terms of sequence. So I thought, if Max can be used directly to be delivered to cells, maybe Omomic can be used the same way. And if not, we can modify Omomic slightly so that it's more similar to Max and try to deliver it as a drug to cells. So I started talking uh, to Pierre and to people in his lab, and in particular, uh, I had the enormous luck of talking to a postdoc in Pierre's lab, marie Bolio, that decided to do a second postdoc in my lab. She was an expert in this type of proteins, but also in their production as recombinant protein. What does that mean? Uh, so we could produce homomic from E. coli. Bacteria could uh, be used as a factory to produce homomic, not homomic transgene, but homomic mini protein. And uh, uh, Mariev tested uh, homomic, in this case, uh, fluorescently labeled homomic in cells. And we saw that in 20 minutes, all the cells were positive for homomic. So homomic was able to penetrate them. Not only, homomic was penetrating nuclei very efficiently. So it passed through barriers, the cell membrane and the nuclear membrane. We characterize the mechanism of entrance uh, through the use of uh, different endocytosis inhibitors just to see how homomic was penetrating cells. Uh, we immediately saw that uh, if we lowered the temperature to four degrees, this entrance was blocked. So we knew that this was an ATP dependent endocytosis mechanism. And then we saw that uh, homomic can penetrate cells through at least clathrin dependent endocytosis, macropinocytosis, and caviolin dependent endocytosis. This was really good. Why? Because uh, um, the more mechanism homomic has to enter cells, more difficult it will be for the cell to become resistant to it. Not only these mechanisms of endocytosis are enhanced in cancer cells compared to normal cells because cancer cells are continuously capturing nutrients. So homomic can hijack these uh, uptake methods uh, by cancer cells to penetrate them more efficiently. So this was really, really a nice finding. And uh, with this, uh, we uh, basically developed uh, this um, homomic derived cell penetrating proteins that we patented. They could penetrate cells, reach their nuclei, attack and they can cause selectively cancer cell death. Normal cells didn't die, cancer cells only died as a consequence of it. So we patented this, the use of these cell penetrating peptides in 2013, and with Maria, we proceeded to found Peptomic, our spin off company of the Valdebron Institute of Oncology and ICREA. And at that point, we had to show that uh, the mini protein behaved like the transgene. So we saw that it could kill cancer cells specifically with an IC50 in the low micromolar range. That is okay, it's, good. it's a good range for pharmacological uh, development. And uh, it is um, um, specific for MIC already in this test because uh, uh, we included, for example, chef cells that in the literature are described as being uh, less MIC dependent. And you can see that the IC50 in that case would be much higher. So we know that in this range, we can um, look, uh, we can attack MIC dependency. Uh, we also saw that uh, the arrest or death of the cells happen in different phases of the cell cycle. The outcome is always the same, but in different cellular contexts, we have a different um, uh, phase of the cell cycle being uh, mostly affected. And we had to show that this was really, really mix specific. Uh, remember that we were told that we were pumping cells with a big and bulky cell, uh, with a big and bulky protein. So we had to show that we were acting really through mix. So we looked at uh, uh, MIC binding to DNA. So these are some uh, bona fide MIC target genes. And you can see in uh, uh, black, 
the nice binding of NIC to the promoter of these target genes. And in green below, you can see the effect of the homomic treatment. Homomic displaces MIC from its target genes, and you can see this genome-wide. So in red here, you can see MIC bound to the transcription starting site of different target genes, and next to it, the homomic effect. We calculated that homomic can displace MIC from more than 97% of its target genes. And uh, we saw the very nice transcription and reprogramming of these cells, so we saw the the shutdown of the classical NIC fingerprint. I'm showing you here three non-small cell lung cancer cell lines, but this is true for all the cancer cell lines that we looked at. And this is specific for NIC because other BHLA zip uh, factors involved in this case in non-small cell lung cancer are absolutely not affected. So we are on target. Encouraged by these in vitro results, we decided to go in vivo. And we were warned that uh, we couldn't go in the bloodstream. We had to go local because many proteins do not survive the bloodstream. So we were treating lung cancer at that point and uh, we decided to try the local administration. So a small drop of omomic, for, in this case fluorescent omomic, next to the nostril of the animals, the animals would uh, inhale it. And in one hour we saw that the whole lung was positive for omomic. But not only, we saw that other organs were positive too. Brain, for example, or liver, or pancreas, or kidney, or intestine, oh, sorry. Um, this already suggested that the uh, omomic was able to travel through the bloodstream because this is one hour only, and uh, all these other organs have been reached by omomic. I'll get back to this. Uh, what we cared though was the effect of omomic on the lung tumors. We saw something again really surprising that uh, these are animals that carry adenocarcinomas, KRAS driven adenocarcinomas, and 24 hours after the intranasal installation with radioactive omomic in this case, omomic can be found specifically inside the tumors while the rest of the tissue, the normal tissue, has washed it off. So it looked like omomic had a tropism for tumors, new where to go and where to persist. Um, this was uh, the basis for filing of a patent of the use of omomic uh, as a teragnostic, uh, as a tracer for lung tumors. And 48 hours after the intranasal administration in the lung, we still detect as much omomic as we detected it half an hour after the installation. So this was the first indication that omomic actually was quite sturdy could survive in the tumor tissue very, very long. Um, and as we had seen in vitro, we saw the shutdown of uh, uh, the MIC fingerprint, uh, but we also saw that KRA signaling was basically shut down. Remember, MIC is downstream of KRA, so the KRA signaling funnels through MIC, and in even in MIC, shuts down also the, the classical RAS fingerprint. Not only in vivo, we were able to see something that in vitro we might have missed. Uh, there was um, a reprogramming of the microenvironment uh, through chemokine and cytokine reprogramming as well. And this will become meaningful in uh, uh, a minute. So what's the effect of this intranasal administration in uh, uh, tumor-bearing mice? We followed the animals uh, longitudinally by imaging for four weeks, during which we treated the animals either with vehicle or with omomic. Um, as I said, when we started treatment, all these animals carry plenty of adenocarcinomas. And uh, during these four weeks, uh, all the vehicle treated animals had adenocarcinomas that grew or even appeared de novo, as you can see here. This is the quantification of the growth of the tumors during these four weeks. The omomic treated animals, though, had absolutely no statistically significant growth of their tumors. This is the, the quantification. So we thought that we had achieved the cytostatic effect in, in these tumors. But the pathologist showed us that something else was happening. As I said, when we started treatment, these animals are full of adenocarcinoma. More than 90% of the tumors are basically cataloged as adenocarcinoma. But the tumor grade has completely changed in the omomic animals. In more than 50% of the cases, these adenocarcinomas have become adenomas or 
you have hyperplasia. So these tumors are becoming less and less aggressive with time. And this is the results of uh, reduced proliferation as seen by CAI67, increased apoptosis uh, as seen by CLIP caspase 3. You can see that here. And we saw something really cool as well that uh, these tumors are notoriously immune deserts. Uh, so they are not infiltrated at all uh, by the immune cells, instead become hot tumors. So there is a huge presence of uh, T cells, CD3 positive cells within the tumor mass. And uh, I'm, I'll get back to this uh, a little bit later, but this already suggested that we could think of potential for a combination of omic with immune therapy. This was great, but was with intranasal uh, omomic. If we really wanted to reach as many tumors as possible and metastasis, we wanted something that could be given systemically. So we took the jump again and uh, uh, we decided to take the risk and inject omomic in the blood, bloodstream, despite the fact that everybody told us that it wouldn't survive. Well, omomic didn't disappear in 20 minutes like other peptides. Actually, it showed a half-life of, of almost 50 hours after the intravenous administration. And uh, with this in mind, we were able to treat animals uh, that had, uh, in this case, a very difficult non-small cell lung cancer, age 1975, human cells that are mutant for EGFR, PM3 kinase, P53, and are resistant to the standard of care that in this case is erlotinib. The interesting thing is that uh, this uh, cell line, uh, we treat it uh, with uh, standard uh, chemo, for example, in the lab with no effect, but once a week treatment, intravenous treatment with 30 milligram per kilo of omomic has this nice therapeutic effect. The first effect is low down in the growth of these tumors, but by the third, fourth week of treatment, the tumors start shrinking. And this is something that we have seen in several contexts. First slow down and then crisis of uh, uh, tumors. So these uh, um, are results that we published in 2019 in Science Translational Medicine and uh, Marie of course, is the, the first author of uh, uh, this uh, paper. But since then, we have expanded uh, our proof of concept to other types of tumors. Daniel Masso, Valesse, but yes, in uh, the lab has been uh, uh, focusing, for example, on metastatic tumors, in particular on breast cancer, triple negative breast cancer. And um, he has started looking at the effect of uh, omomic on these uh, triple negative breast cancer cells, uh, uh, which are called MDA and B231 cells that can be inoculated orthotopically in the mammary fat pad of the animals. Once the tumors are established, they started uh, treating them with uh, intravenous omomic. And he saw this nice therapeutic effect. Since then, Danny has expanded the study to metastasis. And these uh, cell lines uh, have a very, very standard uh, model of metastasis. They can be injected intravenously in the tail vein of the animals. And they see them grow as metastasis in the lung. In this case, Danny uh, basically pre-treated the, the cells only for three days for omomic just before injection. So once the cells are injected in the mouse, they do not receive omomic anymore. And look at what his three days can do in terms of effect on the number of metastases and the total tumor area. So this is a uh, clear indication that this uh, um, Omomic treatment can be really, really um, strong in terms of anti-metastatic effect. Since then, uh, uh, Dani has also expanded the, the proof of concept to patient-derived samples of triple negative breast cancer. He has treated this first xenograft model having uh, this nice uh, therapeutic effect, slow down in tumor growth, and then uh, we see stabilization of growth, and in some cases, even reduction of their size, as you can see here. This gave the animals uh, um, a significant uh, uh, survival advantage. Um, Trini Kaur in the lab also expanded the concept to colorectal cancer. She was focusing on the differences between 
the rectal cancer that has RAS mutation versus uh, um, RAS wild type. And she saw that Omonic is effective uh, in, uh, in both uh, cases. She has started uh, doing some experiments in patient-derived xenograft as well. This is a patient-derived sample that has been treated only for two weeks with Omonic. Only two weeks of Omonic, and we already see this nice effect on uh, tumor volume. Um, and going back to other potential indications for omic, uh, I showed you earlier that upon intranasal administration, we can reach the brain. There is a direct route of delivery, nose to brain route, that can be taken advantage of. So we have our glioblastoma xenograft model in which we can implant patient-derived samples inside the brain of, uh, of um, animals and uh, treat the animals intranasally with Omomic. This is work uh, basically performed by Jonathan Whitfin and Laia Foradada in the lab. And they saw this nice therapeutic effect of intranasal Omomic. When we started talking about this intranasal administration, we found quite a lot of resistance because while intranasal administration of therapeutics is already tested in clinical trials in the context of neurological diseases, Unfortunately, in oncology, uh, is not accepted yet. And we are pioneering too many things to add this to the list of risks for investors, etc. So we were recommending not to use intranasal administration also because the, the dosing control is quite difficult. So we recently switched to a different type of administration to glioblastoma. And uh, in, in this case, we were told by uh, Dr. Saukio in the... the the Valdebron Hospital that very often after surgery, um, the patients are left with uh, a route of administration for analgesics. So we thought that we could deliver omomic uh, um, through this route. And to mimic that in animals, in animal models, we made use of osmotic pumps. These uh, osmotic pumps can be implanted uh, in the, on the back of the animals and basically release very slowly, but continuously, omomic into the brain. And you can see, here, the CHI-67 positivity in animals that have been treated with Omonic for two weeks only. You can see that there is a very significant reduction in the uh, proliferation of these tumors as a consequence of Omonic treatment. Um, and uh, last but not least, I would just like to touch upon uh, one of the most exciting line of research uh, related to the Omonic use. Um, Silvia Casacuberta is an immunologist uh, in the lab and she decided to focus on the recruitment of T cells inside the tumors as a consequence of omic. She saw that this recruitment increases over time. So this is the quantification of uh, um, CD3 positive cells at one week versus four weeks inside the tumors and you can see that they increase. Um, she characterized this immune infiltrate and she realized that these are activated CD4 T cells um, that have a Th1, Th17 phenotype. Why is this relevant? Because a Th1, Th17 hybrid phenotype has been related to anti-tumor activity. So the immune system is really coming to the aid here and it's helping uh, in the elimination of tumor cells. Not only she, also so um, recruitment of dendritic cells and the appearance of uh, T cells with a memory-like phenotype. This is very relevant because they are the first defense in case of recurrence or relapse of the tumors. She verified that this doesn't happen only in the presence of intranasal omomic, but also upon intravenous omomic. Uh, you can see here the therapeutic effect of the treatment and the appearance of this Th1, Th17 hybrid T cells, CD4 positive T cells inside the tumor. So I really hope to be able soon to show you some more results of the combination of omic with checkpoint inhibitors in humanized models. So I hope to have some news next time. Um, just to start uh, wrapping up, um, the overarching goal all along has been to provide a viable therapeutic approach for, uh, for patients, cancer patients. Hopefully, 
less toxic and more efficient than the current ones. We know too many patients that abandon their treatment because of the side effects associated to their uh, therapy. And we would like to offer something better to this. So as I said, with Mariette, we founded Peptomic in 2014. And uh, the great news of the year is that we started the clinical trial with Amomic after more than 20 years of research, since I was a student and a lot of uh, frustration along the way we are finally treating patients. So we have started uh, phase one uh, in uh, May. This is a designed uh, phase one, two combined clinical trial. So the phase one is basically to assess safety and choose uh, the recommended phase two dose for the following patients. And this phase one is open to all comers. So all solid tumors that have failed previous treatment. Then we will switch to a phase two, and we will expand the um, use of Omomic to three oncological indications. Uh, so KRAS mutated non-small cell lung cancer, triple negative breast cancer, and RAS mutated colorectal cancer. This choice was a difficult one because MIC is in principle involved in all types of cancer. However, these are the three biggest killers in the world at the moment. And uh, uh, not only we have really met medical needs uh, uh, because they don't really have uh, uh, many therapeutic options. One thing for all the students out there attending this uh, summer school, um, our approach, the, this mini protein approach, is just uh, the first attempt to, to reach and attack a lot of uh, targets out there considered still undruggable. If you think about what we have been attacking so far uh, in, uh, in cancer therapy, it's only the tip of the iceberg. We have ignored, for example, the majority of targets that are intrinsically disordered protein. More than 80% of proteins uh, without signaling pathways involved in cancer are intrinsically disordered protein, and we have ignored them so far. Uh, with this uh, mini protein approach, we can think of uh, exploring the rest of the iceberg, but there are other uh, ways of exploring the rest of the iceberg, and I really, really encourage you all to take the dive and uh, try to, to look at this enormous potential out there. And with this, I will close recognizing the amazing collaborators we have around the world, the funding agencies that made this possible, but uh, most of all, the team, uh, so my laboratory at the Valdebron Institute of Oncology works side by side with the team of Peptonic. They share the same lab space and this creates a wonderful synergy uh, that I really, really want to acknowledge. And with this, I'll end and I thank you all for your attention. Well, thank you very much, Laura. Um, I think this was absolutely mind blowing. I, I, I have to say I'm totally impressed. I, 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 of course, I was familiar uh, broadly with, with your work, but seeing this, this account of the, the, the story, like you say, yeah, so from the basic idea to how this uh, evolved, it's, it's really amazing. Um, I, I learned a lot also because my background is not uh, fully in, in scope. I'm, I'm more into macro things, so treatment, uh, planning, and uh, robotics, image analysis, and things like that. Um, and and you, you're going to have to forgive me for my, my, fair, my first question because it may sound totally dumb. But uh, I, uh, I was thinking of this, um, this movie <laughs> where uh, I think it's uh, Emma Thompson uh, plays the, the role of a, of a researcher that finds a cure for, uh, for cancer, right? And she's being, uh, she's being interviewed on, on CNN or whatever and asked, oh, so it sounds like you cured cancer altogether, yeah, or for all uh, cases. And she thinks and says, hmm, I think we have. <laughs> so uh, this, this movie, uh, and this is why I say you have to forgive me, is uh, I Am Legend with uh, Will Smith, and then everybody becomes a zombie because of the treatment. Uh, but uh, just, just, to, to, um, just for the anecdote, yeah, but uh, I, I guess, I guess my, my first question goes into these two directions, yeah, whether, uh, whether because it sounds a lot like this is a silver, silver bullet, yeah, like you found something that really targets different types of cancer, 
in, in a way that it may actually work uh, because it's, it's uh, the delivery and everything seems um, somehow uh, doable, right? It's, it's not something that, that you need a, a totally crazy type of delivery uh, for the treatment. Um, so my first question would be about, about this, about your prospects for uh, general uh, treatment of, of cancer. And the second question would be about uh, pitfalls or side effects, of course, not becoming a zombie, but uh, something that you think. <laughs> Hopefully uh, not. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Um, no, thanks for the question. Actually, the expectations are extremely high because as I said, uh, Nick uh, is involved in the majority of human cancers, uh, the, the therapeutic effect still, need, still needs to be established in uh, human patients, of course. And we know that there are differences between the use of the transgenic homomic versus its mini protein. Uh, the transgenic homomic was amazing. It just eradicated cancer in one week. The mini protein has not reached the same level of efficacy yet. Uh, um, and that, for example, justifies uh, its use in combination with the standard of care, which is probably the way it will be employed eventually in, uh, in patients. So it's all to be optimized. I think that we have room for improvement. But this is exciting because it's just the first step towards being able to, to attack something that is common in all tumor types. Uh, and uh, it might uh, simply make tumors more sensitive to the, to the standard of care care, not necessarily replace the standard of care from the very beginning. It might be what sensitizes all cancer cells to, uh, to the standard of care or allows us to lower the dose that we use with, uh, with uh, toxic drugs at the moment. No? Uh, simply having the, the possibility of lowering the doses that we use would have a huge impact on a patient's quality of life. So this is all we, we have just opened a new area uh, for exploitation here. Uh, and uh, let's hope uh, we, we can make the right use of it. Ah, in terms of side effects, you were asking about the side effects. So in animals, at the moment, you know that before getting to a clinical trial, it's not enough to do your experiments in, uh, in mice. You have to show uh, your safety in at least other two animal species. And, and we had to do it out of choice of the regulatory agency in rats and the non-human primates. And I'm very happy to say that uh, none of these three species had side effects, even at very high doses and long-term treatment with homomic. Um, so in terms of uh, safety, it looks like homomic is keeping its promise. The phase one clinical trial that we are doing now is uh, designed to assess that uh, in human patients. We are being extremely careful, as you can imagine. Um, I don't know if you guys are familiar with the phase one clinical trial, but you start with very low doses of uh, omonic and then you escalate the dose uh, very gradually to make sure that we are not harming the, the patients. We are only benefiting them. And this is what uh, we hope to see. Okay, thanks very much. Uh, I think we had a question from Ben Gantenbein. Yes, good morning. Uh, very interesting talk. Thank you very much. Very exciting research. Um, do you also find, um, one wise question is partially answered already. I was asking, do you also test it in other animals than, than rodents? And the other, I mean, you mentioned at some point that these CMIC inhibitors uh, there is no real uh, translation case now, so um, it never came into the clinics. Why do you think, uh, how, or how could you make this translation happen now in this stage? Do you think you will be able to, to find a drug and to release it? So our drug is now in clinical trials and we hope that it will make it all the way to approval, of course. But there are other um, strategies that are being developed out there. People are attacking Nick at every phase of its, uh, from its transcription to its translation uh, to its degradation. So there are uh, uh, approaches like G quadruplex inhibitors. There is uh, something in the, in the promoter that is called a G quadruplex structure. People are trying to stabilize the G quadruplex so that Nick cannot be transcribed. That's one of the ways. Uh, there are uh, people that are interfering with Nick translation. There are people that are using siRNAs you know, the old fashioned siRNAs against uh, Nick. They even got the clinical trials, the phase one clinical trials. Um, and uh, then there are the new approaches with the greatest products. So 
uh, the interest for MIC at the moment is really, really high. We have uh, the first camera advantage, but uh, a lot of other approaches are coming out there. So I believe that we will succeed. But we are too many to, uh, not to find uh, a way. Okay, thank you very much for answering the question. Thanks. Thanks. Um, uh, I think we, we had a, a question in the chat. Um, the first I see is from Keith Kennedy. Maybe Keith, you want to ask directly? Sure. Uh, yes. Thank you for the interesting talk. I really enjoyed it. And I just wanted to know what happens when uh, treatment with alma mic happens in healthy cells? Like, do the healthy cells become affected too? Is there inhibition of MYC? So what we saw was that, uh, um, as I said at the very beginning, in normal cells, MYC gets induced very briefly, 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. It uh, gives the instruction to the cell to divide and then it disappears. So normal cells are used to this uh, uh, transient expression of, uh, of MYC. They are not addicted to continuous MYC like cancer cells are. What happens is that without MYC, we saw that the inter S phase, the cell cycle becomes longer. So it's, uh, in normal cells, MYC seems to be a facilitator of efficient cell cycle. Um, that means that they simply slow down. So you can see this effect in mm -hmm. the intestine or in the hematopoietic system, there is transient anemia compensated by exolocation of hematopoiesis in the spleen, for example. So the normal tissues are able to adjust around the MIC inhibition. Uh, they don't suffer. Cancer cells uh, are not able to, to do without it. Uh, okay, very interesting, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I see the next question from um, Ahmad Al-Minawi. Uh, maybe if you can ask directly. Oh. Okay, hello everyone. And thank you, Laura, for this great presentation. I really uh, enjoyed it. Uh, I have uh, three questions, actually. My, uh, my first question was uh, about the, if, if you're able to target specific uh, organs or specific tissues, because uh, as, uh, as you said that, even when you gave it to the, to the rat, like uh, by inhaling, it was able to travel by the blood. So this was my first question. My uh, second question was, uh, how long did the activation of the omomic omo last after being introduced by the water? Like the, after in introducing docs by uh, water? And the third, how long did the minor side effects like the uh, the loss of hair or, or I think uh, the, the long time in order to like uh, regenerate hair and this stuff, how long did this side effect last in, in, uh, in mice? So um, in the doxycycline treatment, we basically maintained doxycycline in the drinking water all the time. So the transient was on all the time. It took approximately 48 hours to get to, to its um, plateau in terms of expression levels. And then it was kept constant there. Um, the, just to, to clarify, the mice never lose hair. Uh, only if you shave them, you can see that the hair, the hair regrows uh, more slowly. But otherwise, you don't see absolutely anything. These mice never lose weight. Uh, actually, their blood chemistry is absolutely normal. So, for example, the intestine uh, is uh, functional. What we see is uh, if you do um, uh, autopsy, you can see that the intestinal villi are a little bit shorter. But what is the, the uh, normal tissues are amazing. The intestinal lumen compensates immediately and becomes a little bit larger. So the absorbing surface stays the same. There is this homeostatic readjustment of normal tissues that is amazing. In terms of side effects and how long they last, for example, we focused on the testis um, and we saw that uh, during the treatment, uh, the, the sperm density inside the testis was a little bit uh, less. So the, the, the sperm... Uh, um, is, uh, is uh, uh, less dense. But the moment we stop the treatment with doxycycline, in one week, the testis goes back to completely normal uh, complement of the spermatogonia. So mm -hmm. you can expect this to be a complete advantage compared to normal chemo that damages these tissues long-term or causes, for example, hair follicle death. In our case, we never saw any of, uh, of those effects. Uh, with I don't know if I addressed all your questions. <laughs> yeah, uh, just uh, about the, the, the bloodstream. Uh, yeah. You said that uh, when, when you introduce uh, the omomic, yeah. it, it travels all of, like, all of the body uh, through the bloodstream. 
So does that uh, affect all of the body map? Yes, no. there is a biodistribution that it's not equal in all the tissues. So there are some tissues in which our milk accumulates more than others. So mm -hmm. you can envision a second generation or a third generation of our milk in which you can improve the biodistribution for your tissue of interest. In our case, we wanted to develop something that could reach all the possible tissues as a first uh, product. But uh, for example, you can think of pediatric pediatric uh, application in which you want to restrict, restrict the biodistribution of omic to some targets, so some tumor targeting compared to normal tissues, for example. And so this is definitely, I said that there is room for improvement and new generation of products can be developed in this sense too. So yes, that's a, that, that's a very good point. Perfect, thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. Um, the, the next question would be from Maria Segarra. Maybe you can ask Maria. Yeah, we can hear you, Maria. Okay, thank you for your question. I really like it. And well, my first question was about biodistribution, and you answered before. And the second is, um, if you have considered any nanoparticle approximation when you can encapsulate the omomic and to target to a specific organs or tissues, and then to improve this biodistribution that you were talking about. I'm enjoying these uh, questions. I like the way you guys think. Uh, yes. <laughs> so yes, we uh, we have explored first liposomal nanoparticles, and it's something that uh, uh, might improve the biodistribution of some tissues. Uh, so decorated nanoparticles are definitely one strategy that can be taken advantage of. Um, yeah. Uh, so we we have just started with that. So I don't have uh, much to tell about it, but it's it's one possibility. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And, and uh, the next question I have here in the chat is from Stephanie Kamen. Thank you. Thank you for the interesting talk. I'm not in this scope as well, but uh, it must be exhausting and so cool that now you're going into clinical phase. Uh, you must be so proud. And I was just wondering if everything goes perfectly well from now on, can you estimate how long it would take roughly to get to the market to get all the approval you need yeah it's it's extremely frustrating you know <laughs> on the timeline you want this to happen yesterday and uh, it's i've been waiting for more than 20, than 20 years to get to the clinic so i should be used to it and you never get used to the long-term uh, things happening so slowly anyway and um, so we know that uh, we should finish the phase two clinical trial in 2024. Uh, let's say that a pharma comes along, everything goes well, and that's a phase three. The earliest approval that we can uh, envision is by 2027 for the market. Uh, the earliest, considering, for example, approval in triple negative breast cancer, which, is, uh, which could give us an earlier approval. So 2027, 2028 is more realistic for the other indications. So these are the timings. Yeah, uh, at the moment I'm just holding my breath at every new patient. Uh, I'm not a tra I'm not an oncologist, so the first time that I met uh, the first patient, I cried like a dumb. <laughs> no, it was just uh, for me. Uh, this is a moment of uh, extreme uh, enthusiasm and terror because. So of course, uh, I've seen what can happen in mice, but uh, seeing what happens in, in, in humans is the most important thing so far. Um, so yeah, this is, uh, this is where we are. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much and good luck. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the, the next question I see is from Saira Farage. I don't know if you can ask directly, otherwise I can read it. Uh, okay, maybe I, I try to just uh, read it loud. Um, so it says, uh, thank you for your talk. I'm unsure if you covered this already. Um, is there any difference in efficacy in the cancer if, if the cancer has been treated beforehand and successfully? Uh, you're talking about cases of relapse, I assume, or resistance, uh, secondary resistance. 
So this is mostly what we are focused on, on, uh, on tumors that have uh, become resistant or are intrinsically resistant to, to, to therapies. We have started from the very beginning with that challenge because uh, uh, this is what we are accessing now, for example, with clinical trial. As I said, for example, in phase one, you only recruit patients that have failed all their standard of care. So this is exactly where we are starting from. Uh, uh, types of tumors that have resisted, uh, resisted uh, eventually uh, previous uh, lines of therapies. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. And, and then, well, I, I, I kept uh, Jerome with his hand raised all the time. Uh, so <laughs> I, now, now I think it's time to let our general chair uh, ask. Thank you, Miguel Angel. Yeah, this is a virtual hand, so I'm not tired. <laughs> <laughs> Laura, thank you very much for this for this great talk and, and then for sharing uh, all this uh, all this story from very basic research to technology transfer. It's it's really impressive. I have a couple of questions. I have um, uh, pseudo scientific questions because, uh, as Miguel Angel, I don't pretend to be a specialist in your field. I'm, I'm a modeler and a theoretical scientist. And uh, and then I have another question more um, that would be more of interest maybe for for students. Uh, so let's go for the uh, scientific question. As far as I understand, so it's um, the treatment is uh, super efficient when delivered through a, through a systemic way and uh, can recognize specifically cancer cell and enrich almost uh, every organ. So what about the hope of having a successful treatment when cancer has become uncontrolled and then you start to have uh, cancer cells traveling all over the body and metastasis uh, here and there? Uh, so this is, uh, of course, the main question uh, for clinical practice. Uh, metastasis uh, are what kills patients after all. Normally, primary tumors can be removed uh, surgically. So we are aiming at targeting cancer cells, metastasis, wherever they are. And that is something that uh, we are modeling in mice, uh, looking at disseminated uh, cancer models. And in mice, we can reach them all wherever they seed and grow. Um, we hope to have the same efficacy in humans, uh, and it's all to be established. Uh, so that was uh, definitely, that's one of the goals. And then I, I was a bit surprised, uh, positively, of course, uh, to see the capacity of homomix then uh, to reach uh, brain tumors. Mm. And despite, uh, despite the blend brain barrier, which is very uh, impenetrable. So is there, is there any kind of interaction uh, with the endothelial uh, barrier cells that would make them easier this penetration? Actually, I'm afraid that we don't pass very efficiently the blood-brain barrier. Uh, that's why we had to bypass it through the intranasal administration or the intratecal one. So they, this is another way of envision a new generation of peptides that is that can cross the blood-brain barrier more efficiently. What we are aiming at now is to treat metastasis of brain tumor, counting on the fact that they disrupt the blood-brain barrier. So a lot of patients have their blood-brain barrier disrupted by the tumor itself. So we still have the hope to be able to reach this brain metastasis, but it's something that we are going to look at in patients themselves because at the moment we don't have uh, uh, enough evidence in uh, animal models that that could happen. Uh, that's why we are thinking of the intratecal, intracranial delivery instead in the meantime until we have evidence that we can deliver it. Okay, thanks. I know I, I go to the questions that are uh, less scientific and maybe more related to uh, early research career and and yeah i think your 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 track record is is very nice because so everything started during your phd thesis and then you had actually a great evolution of your of your research so going a um, bit deeper and deeper into the understanding of this uh of this protein and then uh eventually then going to a technology transfer and um I know that in general, when you when you try to get uh, external funds, from, for example, from the European Commission through the Marie Curie actions, and even through the European Research Council, so <laughs> they, they don't like your research to be perceived as incremental. So sometimes people are, are struggling to strategically uh, defend 
a, a very coherent uh, evolution, which I think in science is kind of the key no, to success, to be a little bit stubborn over the years and, uh, and keep a specific, uh, and then keep a specific direction. And uh, so I've seen European, uh, the ERC, uh, yeah. ERC logo at the end of your presentation. So I get you went through uh, this process uh, of defending your research as not being incremental, but being worse to be funded. W would you like to comment on that? Absolutely. So the, the basis for, I, I got an ERC consolidated or grant and two proof of concept uh, from the, European Research Council and the, the biggest discussion during the interview in Brussels was around the breakthrough of uh, the cell penetrating activity of the peptide. Uh, it, was, it was important for me to show that it was against the preconceived notion and actually the, those reviews that really pissed me off at the time, that, uh, you know, claiming that Dominique would never be a drug uh, actually helped me. So, see faith of how can turn bad things into chances for you no i was able to say look what i'm showing you here is really something different from what has been published so far and what uh, uh, people have uh, believed so far we saw that this uh, uh, protein as cell penetrating activity can be developed into a drug giving the chance to develop this into a drug to show you that this can work so they told me for example that uh, half of the committee that was there was skeptical and didn't believe that I could do it. But by the time that I had sent my application to the time that I had the interview in Brussels, I had generated the, the first uh, uh, preliminary results of penetration into cells, uh, characterized the mechanism of entry and showing that there was a therapeutic effect. So all of a sudden, during the interview, I was able to to steer also the skeptical side of the committee into, um, into believing in the project, or at least deciding to bet on it. Um, you're right, you, you have the difficulty of showing that what you're doing is different and it's not uh, incremental compared to what you have before. And that's why you have to propose something that is really against paradigm, uh, against dogma. So that can, can make the difference. Thank you very much. And then the last question, because this is a virtual physiological human <laughs> summer school. So, <laughs> um, and, and specifically then this summer school uh, tackles complexity. And this is also why uh, you've, been, you, you've been invited because you, you have presented extremely complex things uh, in a way that everything uh, looks so easy and so straightforward. No. <laughs> no, no, I know, I know it's not. And, and, uh, <laughs> and, and, and this is an art that you have managed super well during, this, during the presentation, uh, presenting things, things uh, in a very affordable way for people. Um, but I'm, I'm wondering whether along the way you have ever needed actually theoretical modelings or uh, non-experimental models to better understand what, what was going on? Oh, thank you for giving me the opportunity to answer something like this. Um, you remember that I said that I was an animalist and that was my attitude all the way. I always looked for the, to, for the application of the three R's. Every time I could replace animal models so with theoretical models or uh, structural studies, et cetera, I done it. Actually, this all started with a structural study. I was looking at the structure of Mick and Max uh, and trying to think why Mick could not homodimerize and I was forced into dimers only with Max. Max is much more versatile and has other partners. Mick was forced to function through Max all the time. So everything started with molecular modeling and structural biology. I was crap at it, I have to say. So <laughs> I was not very good as a structural biologist. Actually, I, was, I benefited from other people that were much better than me. So I, I have to thank them forever for that. But what I mean is that uh, um, every time that I was able to, to take advantage of models, I did all the way. Um, and uh, predictive studies and everything that I could do with uh, in silico, been done in silico. 
even the toxicity studies, uh, uh, immunogenicity studies, etc., for rats and non-human primates, everything that we could do in silico, we did. For example, the predict the, to predict the immunogenicity of our protein, we used in silico studies. It's extremely important and it makes all your conclusions so much, so much stronger. One thing is the biological outcome that you see in animals, but having the, the model in your head uh, supported by, by in silico studies is fantastic and it gives you so much more um, tips to tweak the system all the time. Thank you very much, uh, Laura. Okay, thanks yeah. a lot, Jerome, for your questions. Um, I think we are spot on time. We have like 30 seconds to, to close the, the, the intervention. I would like to thank you again, Laura, for the fantastic presentation. I, I think it's not, not only scientifically, but also in, in, in showcasing how research is done, and how it evolves, and, and, and kind of give this picture also for the, for the students that are, uh, and for us also to learn uh, how, how things are done properly. Um, I think now uh, we, we have a, a break until 10.55 uh, and, and next we will have the presentation of Vicenta Llorente um, and without further ado, well, I, I just thank would like you. to thank you. Yeah. And enjoy the rest of the event. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Laura. Thank uh, you. Anita, do you want to explain the breaks? Because I, I think there are room then to have people talking. Yes, um, exactly. It's the same link. So I will ask uh, Laura if she can stay with us uh, 15 minutes more. And if you guys want to ask questions or hang out with La uh, Laura, she will be here the next 15 minutes. It's the same link. Thanks, Anita. And uh, if not, uh, see you in 15 minutes uh, with the next speaker. <laughs>